What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about pituitary disorders. This is a part of our clinical medicine section. If you guys enjoy these videos, they make sense, they help you, please support us. You can do that by hitting the like button, commenting down in the comment section, and also subscribing. Additionally, what I really recommend for you guys to really understand this topic, I really think it's going to be helpful for you guys. Go down in the description box below, there's a link to our website. On our website, if you guys subscribe, become a member, you'll have access to thousands of notes, tons of illustrations, thousands of quiz questions, and if you guys even look into it more, we're even developing courses for those exam prep courses, such as your USMLE Step 1, Step 2, Pants, NCLEX, etc. So be on the lookout for those. All right, let's talk a little bit, my friends, about the pituitary disorder. So there's two types. <clears throat> One is hypopituitarism. So this is whenever you're not making enough of those pituitary hormones. We know from physiology that the pituitary is the master endocrine gland, right? So it's responsible for producing tons of hormones. And they're more of like your stimulating hormones, if you want to think about it. What happens if the pituitary, anterior pituitary, and posterior pituitary stop being able to produce a lot of those hormones? There's a lot of derangements that can result from this. So let's talk a little bit about this. So first thing is, we have this kind of basic drawing here. So we have to know that this is going to be the hypothalamus here. This would be the mammillary bodies. And then there's the pituitary stalk or the infundibulum. And then here we have the posterior pituitary and the anterior pituitary. Now, whenever somebody has hypopituitarism, there's really only comes down to it two particular problems. One is something is compressing the pituitary, right? The anterior pituitary, posterior pituitary, there is significant compression of that. And when you compress the tissue, you reduce the ability of that tissue to get good, good, good blood flow, as well as you reduce the ability of that tissue to produce hormones. The other concept here is it could be due to direct destruction. And there's multiple mechanisms of this destructive process that we'll go into more detail of. But if we're compressing the actual pituitary tissue, or we're destroying the pituitary tissue, in general, you lose the ability of this pituitary tissue to produce hormones. Now, what's really cool here is, is that when you zoom in on the pituitary tissue, there's multiple different cells or nuclei that are responsible for secreting these hormones. If you look in the anterior pituitary, you have all these different types of trophic cells. And these trophic cells are the ones that are responsible for making specific hormones. If unfortunately I have compression or destruction, I lose the capability of these somatotrophs to produce a particular hormone. Somatotrophs help to make what's called growth hormone. And so as a result, there'll be a reduction in all of these. Let's actually just put down here. All of these will have a reduction in the respective hormones. Now, if the somatotrophs don't release growth hormone, what we will see out of this is a resulting growth failure, which we'll talk about in the complications. If the lactotrophs are damaged from compression to destruction, they will lose the capability of being able to produce another hormone, which is referred to as prolactin, which will lead to lactation failure, which we'll talk about. If the gonadotrophs are damaged, you'll lose the capability of these cells to release two types of hormones. One is called follicle stimulating hormone, and the other one is called luteinizing hormone. These are important for helping for spermatogenesis, they help within the actual ovary, uh, ovulatory and menstrual cycles, and they also play a role in your uh, particularly testosterone production for luteinizing hormone, and then progesterone production for the female. But either way, these patients will receive what's called hypogonadism. The other one is the thyrotrophs. If these are damaged, they lose the ability to produce a very specific type of hormone, which we refer to as TSH, and this can result in secondary hypothyroidism. If corticotrophs are damaged, they lose the capability of being able to produce a hormone referred to as ACTH, and this can lead to secondary adrenal insufficiency. Lastly, if there is damage, enough compression or destruction, that it extends to the posterior pituitary, anterior posterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary has multiple different nuclei. Oftentimes we refer to it as the supraoptic nucleus, <clears throat> but it's responsible for secreting a hormone that's already been synthesized in the, in the terminals known as vasopressin or also referred to as ADH. And oftentimes this will lead to a very interesting disorder that we'll talk about called diabetes insipidus, central diabetes insipidus. So this is what we see as a result is that you have massive drops in hormones. Oftentimes the most common ones that are usually affected here are going to be particularly things like growth hormone, prolactin, maybe the gonadotropins, but usually these three are usually the ones that are lost last. All right, 
Let's go into this now talking about the actual things that cause compression of the pituitary or that cause destruction of the pituitary leading to a decreased production of these hormones. First one is the pituitary compression. This one's really common. When you think about this in the vignette, what it's really going to be due to is it's referred to what's called a pituitary macro adenoma. Now this is really important. What I want you guys to remember about a pituitary macro adenoma is that these are causing compression of the anterior and to some degree, maybe even the posterior pituitary. But we have to define what we, re what we mean by a macro adenoma. So an adenoma is a t kind of tissue, and what happens is this is kind of an abnormal tissue, and usually what we refer to as a macro adenoma is it's usually greater than 10 millimeters. If you have this tumor that's on the pituitary that's greater than 10 millimeters, that is oftentimes a pituitary macro adenoma. What it'll do is, is it'll compress that tissue, and as a result, you'll see a drop in the pituitary pituitary hormones. So as we look at this, we have to ask ourselves the question, pituitary macroadenoma, big tumor, greater than 10 millimeters, compressing on the anterior posterior pituitary, leads to a drop in all these pituitary hormones that we talked about. How am I supposed to think about this one? What will give it away? This is a big tumor. And this tumor, I mean the actual pituitary gland itself, sorry, sits in a bone called the cella turcica. But right around that vicinity of where the actual pituitary is, is this structure here called the optic chiasma. So here we have the eyeballs, here we have the optic nerve, and then the optic nerve crosses, right? And usually right in this vicinity is where the pituitary gland is near. If this mass is pretty big, it can start leading to compression of the optic chiasma. And what happens is the optic chiasma is supposed to be picking up information from our medial retina, which is from the lateral temporal fields. And so this information would run here and then usually crosses over, run here, and then usually crosses over. That mass effect from the tumor will compress this and will lose the actual vision and our lateral fields, right? What is this called, right? This is referred to as bitemporal hemianopia. Let's write that down. This is referred to as bitemporal hemianopia. Sometimes it's also referred to as anopsia. But this is loss of your lateral visual fields. What would that, what would that actually look like? It looks like this. So now we have an understanding here that if the tumor is big enough, it can cause compression of not just the actual pituitary, but it can cause compression of the optic chiasma, which can lead to the loss of these particular visual fields. The other thing is, is that this mass can be somewhat big. And so sometimes what can happen is if the mass is actually relatively bigger, it's kind of taking up space. Now normally our, you know, there's what's called the Monroe Kelly Doctrine that says that the, you know, inside of the actual skull, there's, it's a fixed space. You don't have a lot of room for things to be able to, you know, get bigger or account, you know, move around. And so what happens is, is if you have something such as blood or CSF or tumor or something abnormal there, it's going to increase the intracranial pressure. And so this mass is taking up space. And so oftentimes what it may do is, is it may increase a little bit of your intracranial pressure. And that may lead to a headache. And so oftentimes these patients may experience what we call secondary headaches. They're not primary headaches like migraines or tension headaches or cluster headaches. They're secondary headaches. So it's important to remember is watch out for any evidence of secondary headaches. So if a patient has evidence of growth failure, lactation failure, hypogonadism, hypothyroidism, uh, adrenal insufficiency, and central diabetes insipidus in combination with visual field loss and headaches, you really want to go thinking about a big old tumor. What could be another cause? Maybe it's not from a compression, maybe it's direct destruction of the pituitary gland. This one's very interesting. There is a condition that's referred to as Sheehan syndrome. This one's really interesting in the sense that whenever a patient is pregnant, their pituitary really has a great degree of demand. In other words, the pregnant individual is depending upon the uh, pituitary to produce an adequate amount of hormones. But if for some reason the patient experiences massive bleeding, so let's say that they experience something that we refer to as 
postpartum hemorrhage. How do you define postpartum hemorrhage, really? Well, there's kind of two definitions, I would say. But oftentimes, the definition is whenever you lost greater than one liter of blood within a 24-hour period after giving birth, or you've lost so much blood that the patient is becoming hemodynamically unstable. That's how we would define postpartum hemorrhage. When they lose a lot of blood, oftentimes we lean to the other factor, which is that they drop their blood volume. If you drop blood volume, what would you do to your blood pressure, theoretically? You'll drop your blood pressure. So oftentimes these patients experience hypotension. On top of that, postpartum hemorrhage is also interesting. It affects a lot of our like fibrinolytic factors and coagulation factors, and it can lead to what's called DIC. So patients can also experience something called DIC. So if you have a combination of DIC, which is we'll form clots all over the place, but you're prone to bleeding, and on top of that, you also have low blood pressure, you know what this can really do? This can clot up some of the vessels and then not perfuse the tissue of the pituitary. And so because of this, you may lead to, we'll represent this, decrease perfusion of the pituitary. And as a result, the pituitary will become ischemic and unfortunately necrotic. And so now what can I see as a result here? I'll have infarction or sometimes even necrosis of the pituitary as a result. If I infarct this tissue, can I release hormones from it? No, and so as a result, there's gonna be a drop in hormone production. So there'll be a decrease in the pituitary hormones. Okay, now, that's one concept, Sheehan syndrome, postpartum hemorrhage, losing a lot of blood, dropping their blood pressure, may even cause DIC, which clot up some small vessels, but prone to bleeding. Combination of those two, poor perfusion to the actual pituitary. If the pituitary has a high degree of demand in the scenario of pregnancy, it may not meet it, undergo ischemia, infarction, lose the hormone production. That's how we get the hypopituitarism. So you wanna look for a patient who's just lost a lot of blood recently postpartum. That would tip this one away. The other one is very interesting. This one is what we refer to as pituitary apoplexy. So we call this one pituitary apoplexy. So apoplexy is basically where you have hemorrhage. You hemorrhage into a particular structure. Oftentimes pituitary apoplexy is you hemorrhage a bunch of vessels around a pituitary adenoma. So the patient usually has to have a tumor which is getting a lot of blood supply. You know tumors, they naturally create a lot of blood supply around them. If what, for whatever reason, this tumor, you bleed into the tumor, that's referred to as pituitary apoplexy. What happens is, from that blood, you start causing a lot of compression of small vasculature around this area. So imagine here, I have some small blood vessels that are running here. This hemorrhage will start extending and pressing on these blood vessels. So what you get is, is you get vascular compression. So vascular, compression of the nearby pituitary vessels that are supposed to supply oxygen to the pituitary. Now, because of that, you're not gonna get good vascular uh, blood supply to the pituitary tissue. And so if you get increased vascular compression, this will stimulate infarction of the tissue because it won't get the oxygen it needs. The cells will die and they'll lose the ability to produce pituitary hormones. So pituitary apoplexy oftentimes will usually present with an adenoma. How do adenomas present if they're big enough? By temporal hemianopia and headaches. So you may say, how would I be able to identify the difference between a pituitary macroadenoma and pituitary apoplexy? It would really come down to the imaging. You would have to get an MRI to say, oh, there's hemorrhage in the area of the pituitary and even a mass. It's probably pituitary apoplexy. Where if I just see the mass, I'd probably say it's a pituitary macroadenoma. Sheehan syndrome is gonna be the easy one though because it's gonna come up with that classic clinical vignette. One last thing is a quick little definition. In some patients who have hypopituitarism, they may only release some of, they may only have deficiencies in some of these hormones. If they have deficiencies in all of these hormones, it's referred to as panhypopituitarism. So don't forget that. Oftentimes that's not too common. You can see that in Sheehan syndrome, but oftentimes it's usually only some of these. But in Sheehan syndrome, it's oftentimes panhypopituitarism. Okay, let's come down and talk about hyperpituitarism. We've already built a pretty strong foundation, so I think you guys would understand now that this one's pretty easy. What if I have a pituitary 
that's just hyperfunctioning. And there could be a couple different reasons why, but oftentimes the hyperfunction of the pituitary itself is usually due to a tumor. Now you're probably like, wait a second, Zach. You just said if I have a big tumor, it's gonna compress the pituitary and it won't, it'll lose the ability to make these hormones. Yes, I did. Oftentimes this hyperfunctioning is from a tiny tumor. We call it a mat microadenoma. We'll talk about that, all right? But if this tumor is very tiny and it gains the capacity to secrete hormones, that means that this tumor must have some of these cells that are hyperactive, a little bit more hyperactive. And if they're a little bit more hyperactive, they'll increase the production of specific hormones, such as growth hormone, prolactin, TSH, and ACTH. So oftentimes you may have increase in growth hormone, which can lead to acromegaly, increase in prolactin, which can lead to galactorrhea and gynecomastia, increase in TSH, which can lead to hyperthyroidism, and increase in ACTH, which can lead to Cushing's disease. So it's oftentimes really important to remember this. Now remember I told you that oftentimes in hypopituitarism, it's not common to have panhypopituitarism. It's usually uh, in the scenario here where it's some of them, like prolactin, growth hormone, FSH, LH. In hyperpituitarism, it's also similar. It's not too common for you to have all of these. The most common is going to be an increase in prolactin. That's why oftentimes 40 to 50% of cases of hyperpituitarism are due to what's called hyperprolactinemia due to a tumor, which we refer to as a prolactinoma. So we've built the foundation here of what hyperpituitarism is. It's a hyperfunctioning of the pituitary, likely due to a tumor that's causing increased production of these hormones, but most likely prolactin. Well, before I get into that it's likely a tumor, you have to also assume that sometimes tumors may not be the only reason why this thing is pumping out tons of pituitary hormones. So I'm assuming that it's this, right? I'm assuming that, oh, we're just making a ton of pituitary hormones with the most common one likely being prolactin, right? That's likely the issue here. So it's likely most commonly going to be what's called a pituitary microadenoma. How do we define that? Well, that one's greater than 10 millimeters. Therefore, this one has to be less than 10 millimeters. So it's smaller, has the actual capacity to become certain types of this tumor may contain certain types of lactotrophs, somatotrophs, thyrotrophs, corticotrophs. It just depends upon what the primary uh, homogeneous or heterogeneity of that actual tumor is. That's likely the most common cause, but you have to assume that there's other reasons. So sometimes in your boards, there actually may be something, because you know dopamine, you have dopamine receptors that are present here on these lactotrophs. And you also have TRH receptors. So I'm gonna put here, we'll put dopamine receptors, and oftentimes it's like dopamine two receptors. So you have dopamine two receptors and TRH receptors. If a patient is taking anti dopaminergics, or, or if they have hypothyroidism, watch what happens. Antidopaminergics will then lead to, what will they do to this D2 receptor? Well, dopamine actually wants to inhibit prolactin production. So if I block dopamine, I will stimulate prolactin production. So antidopaminergics will actually work here at this receptor site and actually, believe it or not, lead to stimulation of these lactotrophs, which will lead to an increased production of prolactin. Okay, so I have to then look, is the patient on antipsychotics, antiemetics, TCAs, some type of antidopaminergic? The other thing is that hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism is when you have low T3, low T4, that comes back to the hypothalamus. And what does the hypothalamus release? Lots of? TRH. If there's lots of TRH, what is that going to do? It's going to bind onto the TRH receptor. And if you bind onto the TRH receptor, TRH loves to stimulate 
the lactotrophs to increase prolactin production. We talked about this in our hypothyroidism video, how you can have hyperprolactinemia as a result here. This is usually severe hypothyroidism. So it's important and it's a very great value for you to look through the clinical vignette and history to see are they taking any antidopaminergics or do they have severe hypothyroidism before assuming that it's a pituitary microadenoma. You wanna know why? Pituitary microadenomas, you just know, okay, these patients will have a high pituitary hormones. Most, most commonly, it's gonna be prolactin. Same thing, a lot of these are gonna be prolactin. This, you'll have maybe a history of the drugs. This one, you won't really have history, and then you'll be like, oh, well, Zach, I'll know, because it's a tumor, right? So it's gonna compress the optic chiasma. No. That's the thing. With pituitary microadenomas, there's usually little mass effect, little or no mass effect because it's a tiny tumor. So since it's a tiny tumor, are you going to have bitemporal hemianopia? Are you going to have these secondary headaches due to maybe a, due to a little increase in intracranial pressure? No, because the tumor isn't big enough to cause compression or increase the intracranial pressure. So that's why it's really important to look at the history to see if you can find this vignette before saying, hey, let me get an MRI. All right. All right, my friends, we've talked about the pathophysiology, the causes. Now we go into the grunt work, which is talking about what is the problem with all these low levels of hormones and high levels of hormones. All right, my friends, so we've talked a lot about the pathophysiology behind hypopituitarism and hyperpituitarism. We understand that you're either not making enough of particular hormones, we talked about all those, or you're making too many of them. We went over a lot of the causes, particularly to, with hypopituitaries like Sheehan syndrome, pituitary apoplexy, pituitary macroadenomas, and there's other things like TBI and radiation therapy. With hyperpituitarism, we talked about it's primarily a pituitary microadenoma. With that being said, I want you guys to start thinking kind of changing gears here. Okay, I know the causes, I know the pathophys a little bit, but what are the complications of having few levels of these hormones or deficient levels of these hormones? Well, let's say that a patient has a deficient production of one of these, and that is ADH. Whenever there's low amounts of ADH, I kind of mentioned this in kind of passing, that it can lead to something called central DI. DI is for diabetes insipidus. What happens in this process is ADH is supposed to bind onto these little receptors, they're called the vasopressin receptors or the V2 receptors. And when ADH binds here, what it's supposed to do is, it's supposed to stimulate the movement of water. So water is supposed to move through the collecting duct. And as it moves through the collecting duct, there is ADH present, which will help to stimulate the presence of aquaporin channels. And so generally some of the water may go out into the urine but some of this water should be absorbed, but it's dependent upon the presence of ADH. If there's very little ADH present, what's the problem here? Well, less ADH means I will not stimulate this process. This will be inhibited. I won't reabsorb water. So there'll be less water that is reabsorbed. If there is less water reabsorbed, that means I'm gonna have a massive water loss in the urine. So with that being said, you're losing tons of water in the urine. What's the end result of all of this? Well, I'm not reabsorbing a lot of water. And because of that, my osmolarity of the plasma starts kind of going up and I start getting really thirsty. And oftentimes this will present with what we call polydipsia. This is a super common presentation. On top of that, you're losing tons of water in the urine and it's very large volumes and you're peeing quite frequently. And so this is called polyuria. It kind of sounds like diabetes mellitus, right? Except they have polyphagia. The big difference here is that the polyuria and polydipsia are oftentimes accompanied with hypernatremia. And so another thing that you want to watch out for is do these patients have high levels of sodium? So hypernatremia. And sometimes from the massive, massive polyuria, they may also have dehydration. So watch out for hypernatremia, polydipsia, and polyuria and patients who have hypopituitarism presenting with central DI. All right, cool. What if, and this one's not too hard, what if in this process I don't produce an adequate amount of growth hormone? Well, growth hormone is obviously important for growth. That's the, within the name, right? Growth hormone, you have receptors that are present on the liver. And what happens is growth hormone is supposed to bind onto these receptors. And what they're supposed to do is stimulate the production of a molecule called insulin-like growth factor type one. 
IGF-1, some people put ILGF-1, same concept. But if GH is not present or in deficient amounts, you're not gonna produce an adequate amount of IGF-1. If I don't produce an adequate amount of insulin-like growth factor one, what happens is I don't allow for proper growth. I'm not stimulating the skeletal muscles to grow. I'm not stimulating the bones and the cartilage to grow. So because of that, children usually exhibit growth failure. And the way that that looks is it's usually exhibited in the form of short stature, kind of like dwarfism if you wanna think about that. And then on top of that, they may even have decreased muscle mass. And so that's one thing I want you guys to be able to think about. Okay. This could be a very common presentation. This is another common presentation. Whenever the actual pituitary is not producing an adequate amount of another hormone, referred to as prolactin, prolactin is really important because what it does is, it works on some of the actual alveolar cells present within the breast tissue, and it helps with increased production of milk. It also plays a role within some of the actual structure of the, the actual breast tissue, especially in males. And so growth of the breast tissue and production of milk. So if there is a deficiency, in prolactin, there'll be an inadequate stimulation of the breast tissue to produce milk and to grow. As a result, when a baby is born, they depend upon the suckling for the breast milk. However, since prolactin is deficient, there'll be an inability to lactate postpartum. And so that's again a problem with an, a decreased or deficient prolactin production. So there'll be a inability to lactate postpartum. This is a very common presentation that I want you guys to remember. So inability to lactate postpartum. If the pituitary is failing, it may lose the ability to produce another hormone here. And one of those hormones is called FSH and LH. So this is referred to as follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. These may be produced in deficient amounts. Now, both of these hormones work on the male testes and they also work on the female ovaries, all right? So you're gonna get a combination of effects with these. We're gonna talk more about this when we get into the reproductive system particularly. But for the most part here, the basic thing that I want you guys to remember is that FSH helps with sperm production and LH helps with testosterone production. Same thing, FSH help, plays a role within estrogen production and LH plays a role within testosterone production. So the basic concept here is that these are really helping to stimulate the production of hormones. And again, just as a reminder, one would be testosterone and the other one for females would be estrogen and progesterone. Now these hormones play a lot of different roles and I don't wanna get bogged down too much, but if we lose this ability to have an adequate amount, adequate amount, you're not gonna produce enough testosterone, not enough estrogen, not enough progesterone. That's the downfall of this, but what would this look like? You're not just gonna be like, ah, oh, man, my T levels be low. No, you're gonna have some common presentations. Oftentimes for males, this could lead to like atrophy of the gonads of some sort, but another common one is usually libido. So libido may be reduced in this patient population. This could also happen, again, with females when there's a reduction in their estrogen and progesterone production. Another thing is really important for females. They may have menstrual irregularities and they also may have issues with fertility. So you wanna watch out for infertility and watch out for menstrual irregularities or dysfunction, if you will. What do I mean by menstrual dysfunction? What I mean is, is that these patients can have very abnormal menstrual cycles. They may not have a menstrual cycle, referred to as amenorrhea, or they may have very few periods of menstrual cycle, referred to as oligomenorrhea. So infertility, menstrual dysfunction, and reduced libido is relatively common in this scenario. Okay, what else? So the next one here, and I think this is really, really important to remember for these last two, is these are often lost last in the hypopituitarism picture. So if a patient has panhypopituitarism, they'll lose all of these hormones. If they're only kind of losing some function, they oftentimes lose these, and it's uncommon for them to lose these. However, if they did, they'll lose the, ash, uh, the production of TSH, and they'll lose the production of ACTH. Now there is a profound effect of these hormones. I can't go through all of the dysfunctions that we would see. 
in hypothyroidism and adrenal insufficiency. We will talk about these more in these individual lectures. I'll give you a quick run through though. So whenever there's an inadequate TSH, we know TSH is supposed to hit the TSH receptors and help play a role in T3 and T4 production. If there's inadequate TSH, there'll be an inadequate production of T3 and T4 by the pituitary, I'm sorry, by the thyroid. From here, how will hypothyroidism present? So many different dysfunctions. You can have uh, metabolic dysfunctions with weight gain, with cold intolerance, hyponatremia, bradycardia, diastolic hypertension, lethargy, fatigue. Uh, generally, you can have very dry skin, brittle nails, hair loss. Many different types of dysfunction can present in this disease. We're not going to write all of these down and go through all of them. Adrenal insufficiency is another one. So ACTH is really important because what it does is, is it works to stimulate the adrenal cortex. There's different layers of the adrenal cortex, like the zona glomerulosa and the fasciculata and the reticularis. It primarily stimulates the fasciculata to produce something called cortisol. And to a small degree, it may even stimulate DHEA, which is like these androgens that are really important in females. Now, if this happens and you have a reduced ACTH, you'll have a reduced production of cortisol, and to some degree, you may even have a reduced production of DHEA. How would this present? Well, primarily, when a patient has secondary adrenal insufficiency, low cortisol, they can have low glucose, they can have fatigue, they can have lethargy, they can have orthostatic hypotension, they can have eosinophilia, they can have so many different types of problems. Again, we're not gonna go through all of these effects, we'll talk about them more in the adrenal insufficiency lecture. Again, it's also important, these are lost last, so they're not gonna be super common. With that being said, we've really dedicated a good amount of time to the hypopituitaryism effect. What if I now say, we're gonna go the other direction? Now a patient has hyperpituitaryism. We know based upon that definition, they probably most likely have a pituitary microadenoma, less than 10 millimeters, that is just pumping out this particular hormones. And now we're just going in the opposite direction of what we were doing. So in this scenario, acromegaly is the opposite of growth failure. They're gonna be pumping out way too much growth hormone. And if you're pumping out way too much growth hormone, you're stimulating an increase in insulin like growth factor type one. So increased here means increased here, which means you're gonna have an increase in skeletal muscle production, an increase in bone growth, cartilage growth, so many different things. So what are some of the effects? Well, some of the big ones that I really want you to know here is a three-part thing. One is it affects your sweat glands. Right? So it helps to be able to promote sweat. If you have increase in insulin like growth factor one and growth hormone, you're gonna have an increase in sweating. We refer to this as diaphoresis. Sometimes in the exams, I don't know why, but they say that these are big people with like doughy wet hands. Because they're big tissue and they have very wet, moist hands because of the sweating. The other thing is that it also affects insulin. So what it does is, it actually increases insulin resistance because you know the growth hormone helps to increase your glucose. If you increase your glucose, your body produces more insulin. If you produce more insulin and over time, those receptors become a little bit more agitated and less sensitive to the receptors, less sensitive to insulin. So they can experience insulin resistance. Now when patients develop insulin resistance, what does that sound like? Sounds like diabetes, right? So these patients can develop diabetes mellitus oftentimes type two. So they're an increased risk for diabetes mellitus type two. So think about a doughy, sweaty hand with, with diabetes. And then on top of that, let's add more to this. It increases a lot of the actual, so patients don't usually get tall unless they kind of have this produced during their actual growth period. If it's more in adults, which we're kind of seeing with these patients, what happens is some of their bones and cartilage in the face gets really thick. So they get enlarged face, and facial features. When you have enlarged facial features, what happens is, so you're gonna get facial features are going to kind of become more prominent, and the hands and the fingers will become elongated. Hands and fingers get bigger. So all of this thing get enlarged. So you have enlargement of the facial features and the hands and the fingers. 
The problem with that is that with the facial features, especially up here, air is supposed to run in through your nose and through your mouth when you're sleeping and you're not supposed to have all that stuff there. If it is there, it's obstructing the airflow. These patients are at super high risk of obstructive sleep apnea. And on top of that, all this thickening, the doughy hands, especially near the wrist area, you're compressing the median nerve. And so these patients are also at high risk of carpal tunnel syndrome. I'm gonna abbreviate that CTS. So now with that being said, I can already tell that a patient who has acromegaly, which is actually kind of common. If we're talking about these, it's usually this one is the most common, 40%, and then this one would come up as a, as a, as a second, like a runner up, all right? Think about enlarged facial features, big fat hands and fingers, think about diabetes, and sweaty individual. The next one is hyperprolactinemia, and I have to, again, kind of put this next to it. It is the most common. So it's in, therefore, the most important one to remember if you forget most of these, which is okay, because it's a lot. When you produce prolactin levels, and they're up above like 200 generally, what happens here is that prolactin, we already know based upon what we talked about above, is that it helps with uh, the production of milk, the thickening of the breast tissue. Now, when it does this, one of the things that you'll see here, sadly, is that these patients may unfortunately uh, lactate and produce milk uh, even when they're not supposed to. So it's inappropriate. And you know what we call that? We call that galactorrhea. So one very common presentation is usually going to be inappropriate milk production, which we refer to as galactorrhea. The other thing is that not only does this stimulate an increase in milk production, it also stimulates breast tissue production, especially in the male population. And so sometimes this can stimulate what we refer to as gynecomastia, especially in the male population. So you may see galactorrhea and gynecomastia, especially in the male population. The other thing is prolactin actually inhibits FSH and LH production. So you'll see all the things that you would see in hypogonadism, menstrual irregularities, decreased libido, infertility as well. So this is really big things to remember, by far the most common. The next concept here is, with this microadenoma, it also may be pumping out too much of this hormone here, which we refer to as TSH, and too much ACTH. Now if I'm pumping out too much TSH, and I'm pumping out too much ACTH, we already know how this works. TSH, increase the production of T3 and T4. ACTH increases the production of cortisol and to a degree, the androgens for females. So if there is too much of this, you'll get too much of this, too much of this, you'll get too much of these. How would this look? We're not gonna write all these down. The reason why is we're gonna discuss this in way more detail in the respective lectures of hyperthyroidism and Cushing's disease. But a quick little undergoing of this kind of like a recap of it is that it would generally be presenting with uh, usually weight loss, heat intolerance. Usually these patients will also be pretty sweaty. The other concept is that they'll have tachycardia. They may have systolic hypertension. They may have hyperactive deep tendon reflexes. They may be anxious. They may have diarrhea. They may even have pretibial myxedema. Um, and in Graves' disease uh, patients, you'll see like some of the exophthalmos. You won't really see that in these patient populations. So with this being said, you're going to see a lot of presentations on hyperthyroidism, right? You just have to think, could it be due to a secondary cause like a pituitary problem? So you think about this more in the thyroid lectures. Same thing with this one. In Cushing syndrome, you're going to get an increase in cortisol. You're going to get all that lipolysis and fat redistribution presentations, like the moon face, the buffalo hump, the truncal obesity, the abdominal striae, hyperglycemia, hypertension, increased uh, risk of infections. So, so many different things can present in that as well. With that being said, we have really covered a lot of the downstream consequences of having decreased production of these hormones, pituitary hormones, and increased production of these pituitary hormones. How do we go about diagnosing this? Let's talk about that now. Well, the first thing to think about is, again, check the pituitary hormone testing if a patient comes in with any symptoms. For example, 
if I think that they're having growth failure, lactation failure, hypothyroidism, uh, maybe some type of adrenal insufficiency, or central DI. In any of these scenarios or secondary hypogonadism, I'm going to send off all of the pituitary hormone tests. So for example, I'll send off the cortisol and the ACTH levels if I have any inclination that they have some type of adrenal insufficiency. If their cortisol is low and ACTH is low, it's secondary AI, it's not primary. I gotta go looking for the problem with the pituitary. Is it an infarction from Shihan, from a pituitary apoplexy, a macroadenoma, TBI, or radiation therapy? That's where I would get my pituitary MRI. Look at this big goombok hanging in their head. That's a pituitary macroadenoma, which is a pretty common cause. That would identify if it's a pituitary lesion as the source. Now, continue to go on. I think the patient has hypothyroidism, but I'm not sure which type. I check a TSH and I check a T3, T4. If both of them are low, it suggests secondary. I'm gonna go look at the pituitary and see if there's a lesion there. I'm gonna check my FSH and LH, and estrogen, testosterone, testosterone, progesterone. If I think a patient's having menstrual irregularities, if I think they're having poor libido, sexual dysfunction, uh, and maybe even difficulty getting pregnant. If the FSH, LH is low, if their estrogen and testosterone and progesterone is low, well then I think it's secondary hypogonadism. It's not a primary problem. Check the pituitary, see if they have a mass or any type of lesion. Next thing is if I have a patient who's difficulty with growth, they're short statured, they don't have a lot of muscle mass, it's a child, I'm gonna check the IGF-1. If that's really low, it definitely suggests that they could have some type of growth hormone failure. So what I do is I do what's called a growth hormone stimulation test. You basically give them arginine and glucagon. And what this is supposed to do is tell the somatotrophs to be able to produce growth hormone. But in this scenario, if I give them arginine and glucagon, and they don't make the IGF-1, that tells me that something's wrong with the somatotrophs. Another thing you could do is you could give them insulin, which produces like a mild hypoglycemia. And if that hypoglycemia is strong enough, it can tell the somatotrophs, hey, release growth hormone so that you can increase the actual uh, glucose. But if I give them insulin or I give them arginine and glucagon, and it does not result in an increase in growth hormone, I know something's wrong with the somatotrophs. So therefore, I have to go ahead and check at the pituitary and make sure that it's not having a lesion there that's causing a reduction in growth hormone production. The last thing is if I have a patient come in with polyuria, polydipsia, maybe they have a high serum sodium, and I'm concerned that they have central DI. I can obtain an osmolality. What would this be? Well, if I do this, I'm going to check serum and urine. I have to think about this. A no ADH being present, it won't reabsorb water into the bloodstream. That means the serum osmolality will go up. All the water will go into the urine, so the urine osmolality should go down. All right, if that's the case, then this person has DI likely. The only way that I can truly determine if it's central or if it's nephrogenic DI is I have to do something called a DDAVP test. Give them DDAVP, which is ADH. If I give them that and their urine osmolality flips and their serum osmolality flips, then it's likely central DI. And I've determined that it's probably central DI. Let me look at the pituitary, see if there's a mass, infarction, radiation necrosis, or some type of trauma that's likely the cause here. All right. In the same way, I gotta do this for hyperpituitarism. If I have a patient who's coming in and I think, okay, I think they have Cushing's, they have that type of presentation. I'm gonna send off the cortisol and the ACTH levels. If it's high cortisol, high ACTH, it's probably a good confidence that it could be coming from the pituitary. They probably have Cushing's disease. I'd get a pituitary MRI. And here I see a tiny little microadenoma that's, sorry, right here, a tiny little pituitary microadenoma that's present. That would tell me that there's definitely a pituitary microadenoma as the lesion and the source of this increased ACTH and then subsequently the increased cortisol levels. If I check a prolactin because a patient's having galacteria, gynecomastia, menstrual like irregularities, uh, low libido, erectile dysfunction, difficulty getting pregnant. I check the prolactin, it's greater than 200. All right, it's probably hyperprolactinemia. Make sure I rule out dopamine uh, antagonists, make sure I rule out hypothyroidism, and if I do, get a pituitary MRI, look to see if they have a microadenoma that's causing this. Same thing, I think that the patient has hyperthyroidism. They're presenting with features that are concerning for that. Check the TSH if it's elevated and then the subsequent T4 is elevated, it's secondary, get a pituitary MRI, find the lesion. If I get an IGF-1 and I'm suspecting that they have acromegaly, it'll be elevated. What I do is I wanna try to see something really interesting. I'm gonna do something called an oral glucose tolerance test. You give them glucose 
that should trigger hyperglycemia. So hypoglycemia was supposed to stimulate GH release. Hyperglycemia would then suppress GH release. If this is a tumor, it doesn't care about glucose or anything. It's going to continue to produce GH. So if the GH is still being in high levels, it's a tumor that's pumping out GH and nothing is shutting it down. So in this particular situation, I think that they have acromegaly, get a pituitary MRI, see if I can find a microadenoma. All right, that's a lot. I think the question arises, I find the lesion, I find that the patient has hypopituitarism based upon one of those millions of presentations. I get the pituitary MRI and I see they have a pituitary macroadenoma. I find that it's maybe Sheehan or um, you know, uh, potentially apoplexy that caused infarction or some other potential etiology. How do I treat these patients? Well, with any of these situations, it's always about replacing the hormones that they're missing. So if they have adrenal insufficiency, you give them hydrocortisone, you give them steroids because that's what they're missing. If they have hypothyroidism, you give them thyroid hormone. If they have hypogonadism, you give them the respective hormones that they need, testosterone for males, estrogen for females. If they have a growth hormone deficiency, you give them growth hormone. If they have central diabetes insipidus, you give them ADH in the form of desbopressin. And if you have the capability to remove the tumor, remove the tumor. So in patients who have like Sheehan syndrome, pituitary apoplexy, maybe radiation, TBI, it may be hard to treat the underlying cause, but if they have a big adenoma that's causing these problems and you're trying to replace it in the meantime, if you can remove this, they do something where they actually go in transphenoidally and then they resect the tumor if possible. All right. And hyperpituitarism, you have a pituitary microadenoma that's just pumping these things out. The treatment can actually vary depending upon the presentation. For example, if they present with Cushing's, it's best to just cut that thing out if possible. If they present with hyperthyroidism, it's best to cut that thing out if possible. In the other particular scenario, if they present with acromegaly, so in other words, they present with long hands, fingers, lots of sweating. They also present with you know, large, uh, coarse facial features and hyperglycemia. You want to determine if the patient feels like they're a good candidate to operate and remove the tumor. If they are a good candidate, go ahead, remove the tumor. But if the patient doesn't want to get surgery, or if it's not really an operable tumor, there is alternatives. Things that you can use in these patients to try to, in other words, suppress growth hormone release. This would be things like octreotide or pegvizimast. Pegvizimand. Octreotide is usually first line, and pegvizimand is usually second. The concept behind this is that octreotides will directly inhibit the somatotrophs from producing growth hormone, whereas the pegvizimat actually works a little bit more downstream. It prevents the GH from hitting on these potential target organs and causing the release of IGF-1. So again, octreotide will suppress the somatotrophs and shut down the actual GH production, and then pegvizimant will shut down the liver from producing IGF-1. The other thing is if a patient has a hyperprolactinoma, all right, sorry, a prolactinoma causing hyperprolactinemia. In this particular situation, it actually is best that these patients can respond relatively well to medical therapy. All I wanna do is shut down the lactotrophs from producing prolactin. And so first line in all these patients at least try, and one of the benefits of this is twofold. One is I can avoid a surgery potentially. Second is usually cabergoline and bromocryptine can actually have some degree of shrinking the tumor a little bit, which makes it easier for them to actually resect. So if I give cabergoline or bromocryptine, what are these going to do? They're literally going to act as dopamine agonists and they're going to shut down the prolactin production. And so this is something that we would go to first. Usually cabergoline's first line, bromocryptine's an alternative. If they do not respond to the cabergoline or the bromocryptine, they still have symptoms, then you can go ahead and you can try to cut that tumor out. All right, my friends, that is the pituitary disorders. I really hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time.